Welcome to Solutions for Higher Education, a podcast by Scott L. Wyatt, President of Southern Utah University in Cedar City, Utah. To subscribe to this podcast, please visit www.suu.edu forward slash President's Podcast, where you will find both the audio and a written transcript for today's podcast. Hi again, everyone, and welcome to Solutions for Higher Education, a podcast featuring Scott L. Wyatt, the president of Southern Utah University in Cedar City, Utah. I'm your host, Steve Meredith, and I'm joined in this special 100th episode podcast on Zoom by President Wyatt. We are not in the same room, Scott. No, we are far apart. Well, about 18 (laughs) feet. You're in your office and I'm in my office. But that allows us to have COVID compliance. And isn't that a wonderful thing? No one has to wear masks today because uh, we're all six feet apart and walls away from each other. All in our own offices. Pretty awesome. So we were just uh, chatting about the fact that... uh, Uh, This podcast actually fits pretty well in a couple of different ways. Uh, For those of our listeners at home that tune in regularly, they know that that the 2020-21 academic year is going to be focused on uh, us talking about how the sausage gets made in higher ed, looking behind the innovations that we have uh, undertaken and seeing where they stand and and what things... um, have worked and what things haven't worked. And today, in uh, celebration of this, our 100th episode, we decided to talk about how the podcast sausage gets made. And uh, I don't know that it'll be interesting to our listeners, but it's actually pretty interesting, um, at least in my opinion. If it's interesting to us, Steve, how could it not be interesting to everyone else? Yeah. Two smart guys like us, how could it not be interesting to everyone? <laughs> Yet we were talking about the fact that we couldn't believe, in fact, that this was our 100th episode. Um, and and probably, it's, uh, President, it's worthwhile jumping in to, before we introduce everyone to um, just a little bit of the history. Why in the world did you have the idea to do a podcast? What could have possibly possessed you to think that was a good idea? Um, there are those that still ask that question of themselves. So, Including uh, those on the screen here. <laughs> um, no, this actually started um, as a means to try to communicate to the employees at the university some of the things that we're thinking about and um, answer questions and explore ideas. So that's kind of how it started. And, and we've started uh, by bringing in faculty to talk about their research and innovations at the university and challenges that we face. Um, I remember when we were talking about the title uh, for this, that that kind of shaped um, how we approach the podcast itself. Yeah, we agonized a little bit over the title and ran yeah. some, um, like, some analytic uh, studies of what we thought would work and what wouldn't. And we ended up saying this is solutions for higher education. We're trying to find answers to a lot of the different questions. Um, and, uh, and I think that's helped guide us. And so in particular lately, we've really focused on the core of that title, solutions. We've talked a lot about the challenges and the innovations that come our way. Especially, I think we've had um, a focus on, as you say, innovative practice. And and we've tried to, I think, um, also act a little bit as, uh, as watchmen on the fence uh, to kind of warn people about what's upcoming, whether it's demographic shifts or, uh, or uh, enrollment collapses or, um, uh, or even just campus changes that are likely yeah. to occur. Uh, I had one of my, one of my fellow co-workers say to me, I never really knew what was going on at SUU. And then I, I uh, subscribed to the podcast and now I know exactly what is going to happen next because the president always talks about it. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and so I think we've tried to, we've tried to give people a heads up in that way as well. Yeah. But if we really focus on uh, how this thing got started, this is how it happened. I said to you, Steve, Hey, Steve, it'd be a good idea to have a podcast. And then you said, okay, let's do it. 
And then I turn around and you've got the first person scheduled and you've got all the technology put together. So we're actually doing this because you actually made it happen. Well, if you just want to make chit chat, you always need to let me know. Otherwise I'm going to take it as a direct order and just do it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, I think that's been the, uh, uh, the nature of our relationship is you say something and I try to make it happen. And, and we're hopefully we're both good at that. Yeah, the, the word try doesn't work, though. You make it happen. Um, well, that's great. Should we start introducing our guests? Yeah, let's do that. We have, we have a number of people that work every week on the podcast that are really the unsung heroes here. And they've joined us on this Zoom broadcast. And if you're watching this on video, you can see them. If you're just listening uh, at home to the audio portion, uh, President Wyatt, why don't you... Why don't you start? What, and we're going to go kind of around the room, if you will, based on how we actually make podcasts. And so the first thing we do is we find a topic and we find interesting people to discuss that topic with us. So we're going to start out with Bailey Bothorpe. She's uh, my colleague. Uh, her desk is right outside of my office and everything that needs to be done, she finds a way to get it done. Um, and Bailey schedules... Um, our guests. So Bailey, uh, it's all yours. Yes, thanks President. It's been fun. I haven't been um, working here at SUU for too long, but it's been really fun to be a part of the podcast and get get kind of the inside scoop about um, all of the, the guests that you have come on. So it's fun to be able to work with them and schedule them to come on and talk with you and Steve. Um, and then from there, we it goes over to Libby Meredith after after they've been interviewed. So Bailey, um, talk talk just a little bit more about your um, wh- how do you book somebody? What uh, I mean, you just make cold calls, or or the president uh, and I say who we'd really like to talk to, or how did, how does that process unfold? Yeah, a little bit of both. Well, I think um, for this up this season that we're in right now, we we took some time, the three of us, to do some brainstorming about what topics you wanted to cover and then who, who would be a good fit to come on as guests. So it's, it's a collaboration for sure. Um, for the podcast that we did this summer, it was cold calling <laughs> for all of the um, authors that we had come on to discuss the president's book club for this summer. Um, those were just doing research and finding their information and giving them a cold call to see if they would be a part of the podcast. And I think we were really lucky this summer to have all three of the authors um, of the of the present. Uh, what, what's your experience been in booking them? Uh, uh, famous people in booking famous people have they have they largely been kind and nice and agreeable and and uh, or they you know what's it been like? What's that experience been? Yeah, they've all been very kind and nice and agreeable. I think everybody's anxious to share what they've been doing or what they've worked really hard on to achieve, like writing a book. I'd say that's a pretty big deal. (laughs) So I think they're always anxious to share and have a platform to share. Like a podcast is really easy, especially right now. It's easy for them to get on the phone and record a conversation with someone. Everybody's got a little bit of extra time. So, President, we should be clear about the fact that um, we run this podcast on a uh, $0 budget. Um, and the entirety of the swag bag that we send out is a coffee mug. And so these very highfalutin people that we had on for the summer uh, book club all got a, an SUU mug, and that was the extent of the payment they received. So it's, it's pretty amazing that we've been able to book uh, well-known national uh, people of national stature to come on the podcast with so little uh, financial enticement. If you yeah, know. well, the SUU mugs are pretty amazing, so yeah, I can see why they jump. They on. are good mugs. Uh, I think they're uh, lead poisoning free and everything. So, yeah, they're good mugs. Bailey, what's your favorite episode of the podcast? You say you've been here a short time. You had a chance yeah. to listen to them and. Yeah, so I'm I'm actually going to go with one that was quite recent, um, but it was from this summer when you talked with David Shively, the author of The Pacific Alone. Um, I When I booked him for the podcast, I decided I wanted to read the book. <laughs> so I went and got the book and read it in just a few days. 
it was such an interesting story to me and really captivating. Um, and I loved the conversation that you all had in that podcast, um, episode 89, um, about just resilience and grit and how you kind of tied in the story of Ed Gillette who um, crossed the Pacific alone in a kayak uh, to how we are capable of doing things beyond what we think we are. And that was a good little motivation this summer, I think, when things were looking so different and um, we're all kind of in a new environment. I found that to be particularly inspiring. So we're going to go ahead and take just a second and listen to an audio snippet from episode 89. The book was The Pacific Alone by Dave Shively, and it talks about Ed Gillette and his kayak adventure. One of the interesting things about this book was several references in it that he didn't want to talk about this story. Tell us about how you got to know him and, and his willingness to open up to you. Yeah, so in 1987, Ed did this um, kind of never before, never since crossing uh, 2,500 plus miles uh, over 64 days from California to Hawaii. Uh, and he did it, you know, without the aid of GPS, uh, you know, no satellite phone, no navigation aside from uh, compass and a sextant. So he didn't have any sort of inbound or really toward the end of the book, outbound communication system. So he arrived in August of 1987 in Maui to no fanfare. You know, no one knows he's going to arrive, uh, washes up on the beach. And by the time he is able to contact his family and is greeted there, you know, it, it becomes sort of a thing. And the only reason he's, able to fly back to the mainland as an invitation from the tonight show. So he lands himself a spot on, you know, instant fame. You know, at the time Johnny Carson was, you know, the one and only show to America's tuning into. So kind of increases his cachet to instant celebrity comes back to San Diego where he was running a kayak shop with his wife at the time. And all of a sudden everybody knows who he is, is asking him questions and sort of peppering him and, you know, asking him just, I don't know, inappropriate things about this, this, what he saw as more of a internal solo quest. You know, he did this journey completely out of pocket, no sponsors, no media fanfare. Uh, you know, he really internalized the voyage as this test of self, uh, that really did test his limits. You know, you know, he wrote a will to his wife and thought he was going to die when he ended up running out of food along the way. Um, so it was this really kind of intrinsic, important thing to him that uh, when he was just questioned casually about it, calloused him and he kind of turned away from it. And, you know, people ended up coming to his shop and he didn't even tell them it was him who did the trip. And, you know, year after year, you know, he didn't publish anything about it. He didn't write about it. He stopped granting interviews. So in the kayak community, he became this sort of living legend, you know, you know this, this, this feat that no one had really heard about um and then in in the process of reporting you know flash forward call it 25 years so when i was working at canoe and kayak i started covering a handful of these attempts in late 2012 2013 to replicate his trip you know no one had no one before no one had since had paddled to hawaii so there was a handful of guys that were trying to replicate his trip uh in a standard sea kayak and in the process of reporting them, three in a row had pretty spectacular failures on day one of launching their trips and, uh, and reporting and finding out more about these guys who were trying to get a lot of media fanfare and were trying to get a lot of sponsorship dollars. Uh, and, and they all got turned around on the first day and had big Coast Guard rescues involved. I started thinking to myself, you know, are, are these guys really the story or is the story guy Ed Gillette who 25 years ago did this with you know went way further using way less uh so I called that up and we had a conversation that sort of lit the fire for what sustained me through this book project the next five years that was a really interesting book uh I remember actually being 
pretty entranced by that whole thing. So I, I, I love all the books we choose, President, but what, what drew you to um, the Pacific alone? I remember you saying it was kind of the ultimate COVID distancing book. <laughs> That's right. I think there were two things. One, um, I tend to spend most of my time, and I, we, we talk about this a lot, but I spend most of my time reading nonfiction works. And, um, and most of it's kind of academic-like. But when I have a minute, I love to read some outdoor true life story. And so reading the story of this guy um, taking the one-person kayak from California to Hawaii just sounded like a really neat story. But we picked it because it was the ultimate social distancing book. You can't social distance more than that. Um, so that was the that was the deal. If you haven't had a chance to either read that book or visit uh, uh, podcast episode number eighty nine, you should take the time to do it. It's it's pretty interesting. So Bailey, after you book the guests and the president and I record the podcast, then what happens? Then it goes over to Libby, who helps make sure the audio is good to go, and she's the expert on that. So I'll let her. <laughs> so yeah, I'm Libby Meredith. I am an alumni of SUU. I got my master's degree in music technology just in 2019. I graduated and now I currently work for the OTL department as part of their new media team that is helping um, faculty and different uh, groups on campus put together online videos and resources to improve their classes and so that's what i'm doing right now <laughs> oh so, libby for our listeners what is otl department the online teaching and learning department <laughs> yes <laughs> president we've made a big push in online learning we've actually been talking about that and and the otl production team is uh, represents one of those big pushes they do i just know because uh, because i've watched libby uh, literally traveled the entire length and breadth of the Southwest all summer long, uh, <laughs> shooting videos for geography classes and outdoor learning. And they've been very, very active since they, uh, since they started here. But yeah, Libby's job is to get the file for me. So let's talk yes. a little bit about that. Uh, we delve into, we're well, not too much in the tech weeds, but, but the president and I actually record this podcast at the Center for Music Technology, which we yes. also call the Bradshaw House um, <laughs> by the, from the original owners. And we make fun of it. It's a mid-century home adjacent to the campus. Um, and uh, someday we'll take pictures and post it online, but it really is uh, <laughs> the best of 1952 uh, American home building. Beautiful old home. Uh, it just, uh, it's just a funny place for a podcast recording, but we love it. <laughs> And we record on a Rode Podcaster Pro, which is a, uh, a little four-track, uh, four to eight-track unit. I take those little audio cards, look like camera cards, most of us would recognize, uh, SD cards, and, uh, and I take the multi-track version. I say multi-track. Scott's on one track. I'm on one track. And our phone guest is on another track. Uh, if we have live guests, they are on yet another track. And the music is on yet another track. And so yes. you have to keep track of somewhere between typically four and eight tracks of, of audio. And, and uh, you got to keep track of the tracks. Too. That's right. <laughs> yeah. And, and it, it's, uh, it's harder than that, too, because, uh, uh, well, you, you tell. What, what is it that you do each when you get the audio what do you do to it well so the main thing i'm looking for is um so because you're all close together everyone's mics are kind of picking up when everyone is speaking not just when that person is speaking so what i'm trying to do is kind of clean up that person's track from the stray audio you know that's coming from when you're speaking but it's being picked up by President Wyatt's microphone or something. And that really improves the overall sound. And I'm also, you know, trying to look for any, anything I can do to help the conversation flow better. Like, you know, if there's a 
point where you guys start start over you know because somebody messed up i'm gonna take that out and or uh you know if there's like a especially long pause because somebody's trying to think of something to say i'm gonna i'm gonna shorten that so it kind of flows like a more you know like a little bit better than it would it doesn't sound so awkward or you know <laughs> coughing or stuff like that <laughs> <laughs> what, if, what if a car pulls up in front of the Bradshaw house with a very, very, very loud idol? Oh, man. <laughs> well, sometimes I can't do anything about that. Some sounds like I can't, can't really get rid of. If somebody's talking over that sound, then I cannot delete. Obviously, I can't delete what that person, when that person's talking. So sometimes, you know, sounds... You're just going to have to live with it, <laughs> like, we, unfortunately. But We actually have some pretty sophisticated software that can model the, the noise of a room and just, if it's consistent noise, like yes. an air handler or the buzz of a light or something, you can get rid of it. But, but uh, the president brings that up because you're going to have some <laughs> interesting challenges coming up. Oh. We've, had, we've had some people open the door and uh, we've had a few more idle their cars and yeah. I have heard, I think, on the podcast, so I'm currently editing the audio for one of your recent podcasts, and I did hear a door open at one point, so <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's it, you can't get rid of everything, but I try to make it sound as clean and nice as possible. She makes us sound way smarter than we are. She <laughs> is the queen of deleting the hums and uhs. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. So Libby, what's your favorite podcast? My favorite is um, episode number 32, YouTube versus Higher Education with guest Dan Andrig. I got to know, I had the pleasure of getting to know Dan Andrig as a student in the Master of Music Technology degree. And he's very interesting. I, you know, he was one of my favorite professors. And just hearing him talk about his kind of more about his story was really fascinating and also um, getting, you know, that, that subject I thought really applied to me and my experiences at the time. I was actually in the degree program at the time when that came out and um, we did use YouTube as part, you know, as part of our learning process within the degree, but as is discussed in the episode, um, it, they were videos that were chosen by our professors and not just random videos we got to go choose. And so, so there was the context of this is a good source of information to teach you about how to use the software or how to, um, or to teach you about this specific technique or something. So it, I just felt like that was really interesting. And yeah, just knowing how much my, generation relies on YouTube as well. It's like, it's, I felt like it's a very applicable subject. <laughs> Let's listen to a snippet of episode number 32. That's YouTube versus higher education with our guest, Dan Andrick. What extra value does higher education add that you cannot get through a YouTube tutorial? I will admit that there is a wealth of knowledge whether it's YouTube or a paid for service like Pluralsight or anywhere else, there's so many places online you can find this information. Whether it is um, you know, paid for or not, there is a wealth of knowledge and I could learn information. It's just at my fingertips about anything. I mean, I, I could learn quantum mechanics. Someone has put the information online, um, but curating it because there is so much of it the quality of that needs to be curated by somebody who actually understands the subject and then beyond that there's a mentorship element to it that that teaches you application so you know i can read if i want to learn photography i can read and read and read and read all about lighting and how to use lighting and then go experience experiment with it but who's going to tell me who's right or wrong in an environment that I'm going to learn it in a safe way, unless I go out there and get a bunch of gigs and take, you know, people's money and take their pictures and get the lighting really wrong and have a whole bunch of really mad customers. I'm going to learn from that, but it's a lot, 
a lot of painful, painful uh, time. And you probably are out of business before you get the lesson all the way learned. Right. You know, word of mouth, I, I, there's no way I'm going to get more clients in that city, right? So I, I really feel like the benefit there is curating the right content, um, finding the content that teaches the right thing without misinformation. Um, there are a lot of people that put stuff online that have learned it themselves or learned it from another YouTube tutorial, and they may just not know a couple of pitfalls because they haven't run into them yet. But a trusted mentor um, who's curated it and guides you through the process of implementing it into your own art, or or maybe you're not doing art, is invaluable, absolutely invaluable. And that pro- that is prolonged after you receive your actual degree piece of paper and walk away from school. Um, I'm still in touch with professors who who I worked with in higher ed. And like I said, our texts were watching clips of videos on YouTube and discussing them and critiquing them and rescoring them. And um, I think that's really the value and the difference between just hearing and knowing the information and really, truly implementing that into what I do. So Dan actually is uh, now the the program director of our music technology degree as I've uh, stepped away from that, President. Um, and uh, he he not only was a terrific guest, but uh, uh, you know he he wrote the music for a couple of years for Grey's Anatomy. It's one of those uh, uh, one of those things where it is fun to get people of national stature, uh, not only on the podcast but actually working for SUU. So Libby then. You pass the podcast to whom? Yes. So after I finish the audio, I sent the files to Natasha Johnson, and she begins the process of transcribing the podcast. And so I'll let her talk about that. Yes. So I, um, I actually am no longer officially at SUU. I worked there as the administrative assistant for the biology department for two years. Um, My husband graduated back in 2018, so we moved away. So I was no longer to work in that capacity, um, able to work in that capacity, but here I am still doing podcasts, which is actually really fun for me because I get to sort of like stay in the loop still um, with what's happening at the university, um, which is fun for me because I am also an alum from there. Um, So, but yes, I am the transcriber. So I'm the one responsible for the typos, or hopefully there's not all that many typos, but if you do see any of that, it's my bad. Um, though after me, sometimes those two get caught as well, but yeah, I listen to the audio and I just type it out. So, um, you know, some people aren't, and they'd rather not listen to the audio. They would rather read the text. That's usually me because I sort of may speed read things maybe faster than just listening to the audio. But, um, but yeah, so just, yeah, so that we have another format, um, available for people to, well, and we do that also because uh, we need to have this available, accessible to those that are hearing impaired. Right. Yeah, of course. Yep. Yeah. So that makes it so that they are also able to, um, you know, listen to the pod or read the podcast if that's something. So, Natasha, doing. you take a, a WAV file or an MP3 file, mm-hmm. um, and now you have separate software, don't you, that you use to transcribe that sort of slows things down without making them go like that. Just slows down the, the speed of things so you can type at the same uh, type as you hear. Is that correct? Yes, yeah. And I, I, I did try at one point too. I mean, there is software that, you know, you just load audio into it and it transcribes it for you. Um, but I found that it took way longer to clean that up than it did to just go ahead and type it all out. So yes, I have um, some software. It does it does deepen the voices a little bit. Um, I can never do the podcast while my husband is at home because he knows both you and President Wyatt and he just laughs. He's like, oh, it just sounds like they're on drugs or, you know, whatever. Just <laughs> It does lower your voices a little bit. Um, so yeah, I can, I can never do those while he's in the room because I can't get any work done because he's laughing about it. But um, but yes, I do. I slow down that audio so that I can go ahead and type it out. So. Got a tenor. He can use a little of that. <laughs> yeah, so. it's pretty low though. So. Yeah, I can do a little lowering, and Steve, uh, you can't get much lower. <laughs> yeah. I don't know about that. So, so Natasha, um, what you you've as you say, you started. You were, I think, our first transcriptionist, uh, and you've been with this maybe. Uh, as long as anybody what's been your favorite podcast over our now four years of uh, work um 
So yeah, it actually was kind of fun to look back because I have been here since podcast number one. Um, so just kind of looking back and remembering some of the great podcasts that we have had. And I actually chose podcast number two as my favorite, if you will. Um, and it was on free speech. And I remember at the time listening to it, um, I just was really interested with that topic, especially as it pertains to higher education. And rereading it this time, I it was almost even more interesting because just the way that the the political climate is right now um i just think that it is so pertinent um i mean it's a great solution for higher education but also in so many other um facets of life and and there actually is no special guest on that um you and president wyatt are the are the special guests but um those that know president wyatt or or listen to the podcast know that he has a background in law and I think that that offers actually really cool perspective um, on the podcast sometimes. And you guys just talk about how it's not the job of the university to censor speech. Um, I mean, 100% yes, promote appropriate speech, but but when there is speech that is, you know, maybe hurtful to somebody or offensive, um, not necessarily to censor that or stifle that, but to take those two parties and teach them how to have a conversation about it and um, which i think if if universities really focused on that more we wouldn't have so many problems um post university i mean people people would have the skill set then um to to agree to disagree if that's what it comes to um but to not have so much divisiveness and so anyways i really enjoyed that podcast the good news is that we completely ended the discussion with that and it's all been the same since then right president you don't have to deal with this on a almost daily basis <laughs> <laughs> well it, um we did that podcast and another one similar to it later yeah but yeah this is one of those real challenges because many people think that the number one value should be kindness and that all speech that has any negative tone to it should be uh, thrown away. Or speech that disagrees with my political views should be censored, <laughs> however you phrase it. But our job is to be the marketplace of ideas and the good ideas rise to the top and bad ideas um, get washed out. And you're right. And, and, I, and I was thinking, Natasha, as you were describing that, I'm super happy that was your favorite one. Um, <laughs> I remember it from so long ago, but I was thinking as we look back at the the debate, um, the debates that we're in the middle of, the, of leading up to this election, we as a country have a great need to figure out how to listen to things that might be offensive to us and have intelligent conversations about those things. Uh, rather yeah, than for sure. being divisive. Yeah. Yeah. And honestly, before that podcast, I mean, you know, I, I did the did a bachelor's, I did a master's, and it never once occurred to me that, as you point out in that podcast, university is an, a government entity, you know, so if universities are censoring speech, then that's essentially government censoring speech, which is never a good thing. So. Never allowed. Yep, not allowed. Very good. Yeah, let's take a listen. This is episode, going way back. Um, <laughs> this is episode number two. Free speech on the college campus, and uh, this is Natasha's favorite episode. Universities uh, and colleges today find themselves between competing interests. On the one hand, we really want an environment that is welcome to all. We, we really want our students to be respectful and courteous and um, to, to make a place where everybody feels comfortable, wanted, welcome. But in order to do that, too oftentimes there is a temptation to curtail speech. You know, the kind of speech that creates an environment that might be less than warm and welcoming to everyone. And we sometimes uh, attach a name to this type of speech called that we call hate speech. Speech that expresses negative and disparaging things about groups. Groups that are typically thought to be either minority or aggrieved in some way, uh, or, or worthy of special protections under the law, perhaps. Or, or groups, yeah, or groups that have been marginalized um, in one way or another. And so it's just a real temptation that 
universities, at least public universities, are government spaces, and the employees are government employees. The president of a university, that's me. The faculty, that's you. And uh, all of the staff and faculty members, we're actually government employees. Sometimes we don't think that. We're members of the executive branch of government. And therefore, the First Amendment protections of free speech, which bars government from denying free speech, applies to us. We're government. That's The First Amendment was written to keep us from censoring speech. So, President, um, I made a joke about you having to follow up a lot on free speech. Um, the combination of your legal background and your political background has made this, uh, this is a, 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 an issue you're passionate about, isn't it? Right. And even today, uh, a student made an appointment because he feels like um, that he doesn't have as much opportunity to, to speak. And... Um, because of his political views. And, and I was reassuring him that all views are welcome here. And as we kept talking, uh, he started complaining to me about some of the other things that had been said on campus in the journal or wherever they might be. And I got to remind him, <laughs> you know, it's free speech. Yep, and, it's two way street. And I got smiles from him because he, he realized the, the challenge. So my advice to him was to speak more, <laughs> uh, not to try to find a way to silence somebody that disagrees. That's the right answer. But even today, you, you said this is a constant uh, issue. So Natasha, after you've transcribed it, uh, you and I review it to, for accuracy and we talk a little bit about it. Um, I typically will pull a couple of quotes out. Um, usually I'll focus on something that I think is really hard hitting or something that's funny um, that that will capture somebody's attention if they're just just barely glancing at you know the new podcast episode something there that that might attract their eye. Uh, always thinking about marketing, which is where it goes next. Yes, um, I'm Lexi Carter, and I'm the marketing manager here at SUU, and I've also been with the podcast since the beginning, um, which right, is crazy. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I work in the marketing communication office here and run all of SU's advertising, mainly their digital advertising. I run SU's main social media channels. And then I do a lot of work with Jill's team, who's also on this call um, with the website. And specifically with the podcast, though, once I get um, the transcription, I, I'll be honest, I've read way more podcast episodes than I've actually listened to. I'm the one you're writing the transcriptions for, Natasha. <laughs> Um, but I read through the transcription and I draft a short summary that tries to incorporate everything that you guys talk about. And sometimes that's difficult because sometimes the episodes are pretty long and lengthy and you cover a lot of different topics with your guests. Um, and then after I write the summary, um, I send it off to Jill, but then once the, it's published, then I get the link back and I help promote that on some of SU's social media channels. So, Lexi, what is your, um, what's your favorite episode? Yeah, um, one of my favorites, there's a few in there, but you've done a few different enrollment series, and that's right in up my alley of what I'm working on, of like digital advertising and recruitment. And so one of my favorites is actually a more recent one, episode 83, um, with Madeline Rainier, Rainier, I believe you say. Yeah. Um, and she works for EAB and wrote an article in the, chronicle titled know your college is not an exception and in that in your episode she talks a lot about how like at a university it's easy for us to want to sell the transformational experience of a university but sometimes a 17 year old in high school isn't ready to like they don't even know that there's going to be that big of a transformation and that's a really hard sell and so looking at it more as a transaction um and being able to like find out what your values are as a brand and as a university and like clearly communicate that to a 17 year old um, and talking and she again was relating it all back to the enrollment uh, the looming enrollment crisis that is has been in the chronicle and things like that and how no college is an exception to that crisis but how like if you really want to stand out in the marketplace you really need to drill down to like 
what your values are and be able to communicate that in a very clear, succinct way to your audience. Well, let's listen to a little snippet of episode 83. It's called Your College is Not an Exception. And as Lexi suggested, our guest that day was Madeline Rainier, and she works for EAB. This is episode 83. Most people look at the looming demographic crisis in 25, 26. It's always, it's, that's the other guy's problem. Because we, whatever our institution is, we are so special. And we have such a unique sort of offering uh, to students and families that, that the trend that could be impacting other people, it just, it won't, it won't impact us. And so I, I feel like it's important to have um, honest conversations um, and sometimes they end up being pretty direct conversations to say, um, actually, uh, in the in the mind of the public, we all do more or less the same thing. And we do it more or less close to them, more or less well or not well, um, more or less online or in a virtual format. And that sort of the, the traditional, um, if we build it because we're here, they will come, um, that, that just isn't working anymore. And I, I think especially, um, and this was borne out in the results that then became clear later in the fall of 2019, because so many schools last year did not meet their enrollment headcount or net tuition, tuition revenue goals or both, um, that there was, because I'm a huge Star Wars fan, there was a big disturbance in the force. <laughs> and many people, <laughs> many people have believed that, you know, you see the, you see all the demographic charts and everyone is, you know, reading Nathan Gras's work and trying to plan ahead, you thought you had some time to inoculate yourself against yourself, your institution against these, you know, pretty, pretty discouraging sort of um, uh, market demand numbers. And yet with the disturbance this last fall, I think it, it, um, to me, it makes even more clear the notion when the most elite schools in the country are, are failing to meet their enrollment goals. Um, for those who have to work really hard every year to do that, you need. You just need to recognize you're not that special, and you're going to need to. You're going to need to think about things differently to be successful in in both the current market and the market that's coming. One of my favorite parts about that episode, President, was uh, Madeline's discussion about uh, in her work with EAB. She would go out and try to get a university before they've had a chance to think about it to give them uh, to give her their elevator pitch. And her description of what elevator pitches are typically always makes me laugh. Um, uh, you know, we're we're student centered. Well, okay, so so far that's every university. Uh, Out of we, four thousand, uh, you're not distinguishing we'll have the same yourself. Elevator pitch. <laughs> well, well, we're small. That that's not the argument that you think it is. Uh, you know, I mean, it, it, there's two thousand small colleges in this country, <laughs> anyway, or whatever. I, I found her to be really insightful and very uh, funny. She was she was fun to talk to. Yeah. So, Lexi, after you're done with your part of the special sauce, then what? Then I send it off to Jill Whitaker, um, who's in web services, and she does her magic. <laughs> yep, that's my next step. I'm Jill Whitaker. I'm the director of web services, and I've also been with the podcast since the beginning. In fact, I think I've been at the university longer than any of you because I am just a few months shy of my 20-year anniversary of working wow. for SUU on the website. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> I started when I was 12. We'll say that. <laughs> Back when you had to, they were hand-chiseled websites. <laughs> yes, exactly. We carved them out of stone and we put them up for people to see. But yeah, that's exactly where I come into play on this because everybody has done their part, but now we want to make sure that our podcast gets out to the masses. So I take the description that Lexi has written. I take the transcription from Natasha. I take the audio file that has been cleaned up by Libby. I take the pulled featured quotes from Steve, and I package those all up into our actual podcast. That's when it becomes the actual podcast. And it goes out into a podcast feed tool. And we want to do that so that people can listen to the podcast and if they like it, they can subscribe to it so that all future episodes just show up automatically in their podcast player for them. Um, and part of that is also making sure that we show up in different podcast markets. You can kind of get your podcast to show up organically in some of these podcast players over time. But I have gone out and put our podcast in several different podcast markets. So we're in the Google um, Play Store and we're in the Apple um, app store and the 
We're in Stitcher and Overcast. And as of just two weeks ago, Amazon Music added a podcast library to their music player, and we are represented in that. So it's mainly uh, my job to make sure that we get all of this stuff grouped together and then pushed out to the world so that everybody can hear our wonderful words of wisdom. <laughs> so, Jill, we're not, we're not going to put the Joe Rogan experience out of business anytime soon, but <laughs> we, do have, we do have a pretty wide range of listeners. You, you run analytics for us from time to time, yeah. and I've been interested to see that we have regular listeners in the Middle East and uh, in Australia and New Zealand and in Asia, and uh, that we're kind of all over the world. Yeah, I have some analytics pulled up right here right now, and it's uh, it shows little yellow dots across the country, and so we've got representation across the United States, but then there are dots all over in Europe and in the Middle East, as you mentioned, and it's just kind of interesting, and there's even some spots in Africa and South America that are lit up because people are downloading our podcasts in all these places around the world. It's pretty cool. Wow. I think it's because of the pictures that we put up of you and I, Scott. We are, <laughs> I'm sure that's right. Yeah. That's what's selling it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, uh, Jill, what, I'm sorry. Go ahead, President. No, yeah, that's. I'm sure that does it. <laughs> Jill, what's your favorite episode? I vary from time to time because we've been doing this for so long, but. This summer, I actually re-listened to episode 33, which is The Pursuit of Happiness with Grant Corser from On Campus in our psychology department. And I listened to that one because 2020 has been a weird year, and it's just felt really strange and kind of hopeless. And there are some parts of the podcast that resonated with me on the first go around, such as when we have successes, we are quick to attribute that to ourselves. But when we have failures, we are quick to attribute it to an outside source. But later on in the podcast, there was some information about how we are actually, as human beings, we are happier when we are working toward a goal. And that kind of resonated with me in light of 2020, especially earlier this year, because we were all in kind of this holding pattern. You know, you can't go out in the world and do as many things. And there are so many things that are shut down and we were all kind of in this holding pattern and not even knowing how we could work toward a goal. And I think that that was probably contributing to worldwide unhappiness in some regards. And so if people can actually even think of some kind of small goal that they can fit into it, even if they are on some kind of lockdown like we have experienced, it, you know, maybe that will help boost their happiness. This yeah. is uh, Sorry, President, go ahead. No, I agree. That that was a wonderful podcast, and it changes the way I view the world. Because every time I have a success, I remind myself that, that Dr. Corser told me <laughs> that I will naturally give myself credit, and I shouldn't. And when I have a failure, he's told me um, that I would naturally blame someone else, and I shouldn't. So that's really f been fun to think about in terms of just our own – um, personal successes and failures. So let's take a listen. This is a snippet from episode 33, The Pursuit of Happiness with, um, with our faculty member from psychology, Dr. Grant Corser. Um, it turns out that we as humans don't like to spend a lot of time thinking about ourselves. And part of the reason for that is, uh, is, is we're, we're really the most happy. We're really the most content when we have a slightly exaggerated sense of our skills, capacities, and abilities. So often taking a close look at who and what we are can knock some of those things down and put them into a, a state of reality that we then are equipped to fix. So as long as I continue thinking that I'm just a little bit better than I am, then I'm happier. That's what the research wow. indicates. and. You know, again, when you look at this at face value, you go, what's wrong with us humans? But then understanding that, you know, our emotionality is really driven by just a slightly better sense of who and what we are rather than what we actually are uh, seems to be quite useful for us and allows us to function well. So when I, um, when I talk to some people about um, whatever it is they're doing, I commonly hear probably from myself as well as anybody else, that if, um, if we fail at something, we tend to seek an external cause. 
first rather yeah. than immediately try to re-examine what we might have done wrong. Is yeah, that, that That's accurate. And a lot of psychologists refer to this as a self-serving bias. And so it's a protective function that's built into us. If we you know, fail at something, our first reaction is to somehow give it an external cause, just like you're saying. And a common example that's used in a classroom setting is if I'm a student and I fail an exam, the easiest way to maintain a sense of positive self-view is to blame it on the exam, blame it on the professor. If I am getting closer to a self-evaluation or a self-cause in this, I might say, well, it's because I work too much. But it seems to be pretty difficult for us humans just to say, I failed this exam because I did not spend enough time studying. Or I failed this exam because I'm just not at a place where I need to be in order to be successful at this exam. By externalizing it, by putting it on to some other cause other than an internal cause, it really allows us to protect and maintain that, that slightly higher sense of who and what we are. I remember that episode now better having listened to it, President, and I have to say I, I love all of my faculty colleagues, but there's a special place in my heart for Grant. He's, uh, he's not only uh, really interesting to listen to, he's, he's just fun to work with. Yeah. So, President, it's up to you and I to kind of kick this thing home, and uh, since it's your podcast, you get to go last. So I'm going to uh, go second to last. And... Uh, uh, Natasha took my um, favorite, um, so I'm going to, off the top of my head, uh, uh, talk just a, a little bit about uh, a particular episode that uh, that I thought we uh, that I thought we got um, I thought we got right. Uh, so we have at various times uh, celebrated the accomplishments of our students. Uh, we've had student athletes on and and uh, others, but there there was a, a particular episode that was about student uh, the need for student scholarships. Uh, this is episode forty for those of you that are following your program at home. Episode forty is called "The Importance of Student Scholarships," and uh, I loved it because it told the story of two of our amazing students, Shana Bartell, who was um, uh, a, a found herself a single mother who wanted to learn to, to fly. She wanted to have a pilot's license and was, uh, was pursuing that, in the midst of uh, pursuing that. And the other student that was on the broadcast was Newman Conte, um, who's uh, one of our students from Africa, from the country of Mali. Newman is our current student body president and uh, just an amazing story of how he went from Ulesa Bugu in Mali, um, literally living on the street from the time he was about five years old uh, because he wanted to learn to read. He ran away from home to live on the street in the city so that he could um, learn to read and, and through those contacts ended up with a scholarship uh, to a private school uh, in uh, in central Utah, and and he made his way to Southern Utah University, where I think we all agreed he's going to be a, a really dynamic student body president, but also probably the president of Mali someday. Um, and so, uh, anyway, that that was my personal favorite episode uh, of the ones that didn't get stolen by the others uh, here on the thing. <laughs> and uh, uh, Newman is graduating this semester. He is looking at uh, graduate school. And to think of this little kid, uh, barefoot kid running from his little teeny village to the city so that he could go to school um, is uh, approaching grad school. Pretty amazing. It is. So let's listen to just a little bit of a snippet from episode 40, The Importance of Student Scholarships with our student guests, Shana Bartell and Newman Conte. When I was four years old, I left my family and go a different part of Mali. Uh, I always wanted to go to school and learn different things and try different things. And uh, where my parents were, there was no school. 
I never see a person have a book or writing or something. But when I saw my dad uh, paying somebody uh, to he sell the chicken, when I first saw him, um, you know, he told me to grab a chicken and he sell that chicken to uh, pay somebody to write his letter and read it. And that uh, moment, I thought uh, my dad is ineducated. Uh, he didn't go to school. Uh, but now, as a son, what I can do about that? So this, how old were you when this happened? I was four years old. Four years old. Yes. Your dad's got a letter. He needs to read it, but he can't read. He can read. And nobody will read it to him unless he pays them. Yes. So he turns over a chicken, which is a pretty valuable thing. Yes. In order to get somebody to read for him. You're watching this and saying, I'm not going to be paying chickens for people to read to me. For people read to me, yes. So you left home and stayed... Uh, who did you stay with? I didn't stay with anybody as I left home. I was uh, around, you know, uh, just lay down around the next to the building or I would stay in the school. Since, you were homeless? Yes, I was homeless at that time. But you were going to school? I was going to school. How I, far away was this from your home? It was uh, 50 kilometers 50 kilometers from your village? From my village. So I didn't get to see my parents that much. And uh, I didn't have a phone or write them a letter because nobody could read that. And uh, I was just completely disconnected uh, with my family. That's a pretty heavy price to pay to go to school as a kid. Yeah. The story of um, Newman's father being unable to read the letter and having to give away uh, a very important chicken uh, that, that would have been used to feed the family so that um, that he could hire someone to come read the letter is uh, is heartbreaking to me, but also an indicator of the type of grit that uh, Newman has to overcome what is just astounding, almost unbelievable hardship. And on the other side of that, um, astounding support. Um, because he has been able to go through um, high school and college receiving help and s assistance from so many people, um, employees and also um, donors of scholarships and everything else. Most popular person on campus right now. <laughs> yeah, we frequently talk about um, how student scholarships, uh, donations for student scholarships are not are not maybe the most popular thing that we do in, you know, people want their name on a building or, or to do something else, uh, but, but that in terms of impact, there's no greater impact that you can have in a person's life than to donate to a student scholarship fund. Well, should I finish up with my favorite one? Yes. Uh, this is gonna take a while because there's about uh, 99. <laughs> Let me start with the first one, just kidding. Actually, the first one we both agree uh, is by far our worst episode. Don't listen to episode one. Uh, it's, uh, the content is good, but we were yeah. learning how to make it work. Yeah, we decided we would script it out, and so we both sound as though we are reading cue cards, which we were, and uh, it is just so unbelievably stilted and awful that, uh, uh, that we don't recommend episode one. Good at good. <laughs> Good content, bad podcast. I have power. I could remove it. Nah, don't remove it. it. It reminds us of how much better we've gotten. Hopefully. I know. So for my favorite one, it is almost impossible because there are so many um, that I love. And being on the early stage of this, of course, you know, I get a lot of input on who we interview. And so it's just a long list of them that I like. But but for this, I think I would say that maybe, at least in the top listing, and particularly today, um, I would say my favorite is episode number 27 from our first season. It was in the President's Book Club for that summer, and it is the book on the ghost map. And we had uh, a visiting guest, Dr. David Blodgett. He's our public health director. And the ghost map is the story about how the cause of cholera was discovered 
in England um, 150 plus years ago. What I love about the story is that it's great science. It's a great detective novel. It's all a true story. And, and it has a challenge in there for everyone. And that is that the, um, the scientific and medical community in the mid 1800s believed that cholera was caused by miasma poisonous air and everyone believed it and those that questioned them um, were ridiculed so in order to get rid of this poisonous air they drained all the cesspools into the Thames River which meant that they were causing much much more problems with cholera and um, anyway I love the story and and I frequently ask myself when I have an opinion about something, is this my asthma or is this the truth? You know, and um, we all have to be open to new ideas. Um, it's kind of one of the heart pieces of the university is um, being willing to accept that our assumptions might be false. And there's a beautiful story about it. Fun to read. Let's listen to a little bit of episode 27. This is from our first year, the first summer book club which was The Ghost Map with our guest, Dr. Dave Blodgett. You know, ironically enough, or not ironically enough, I don't know, because people didn't really, you know, this was the birth of, of many kind of uh, Renaissance moments, right? Lots of learning going on, lots of changing going on, and you could have people that could be kind of cross-disciplinary and, and, and kind of really geniuses in multiple areas. That's kind of the the hallmark of the area era, and it's really pretty remarkable. And so this John Snow, he's he is that guy. He you know he developed anesthesia almost single handedly. Had three or four other areas where he really excelled, but he was interested in cholera largely because as he'd studied the cholera outbreaks and the epidemics, he he came to believe that the miasma theory, which is kind of the the antagonist in this story, if you want to call it that, wasn't wasn't reality, and he wanted to prove that it wasn't in order to better, you know, public health and things like that. So, so as he enters into the scene, you know, he's interested because he notices that these these people are getting sick rapidly, and they're in a fairly focused area in the city, and that it would be much more uh, studyable than these general. Uh, kinds of outbreaks of color where they had been broad based throughout the whole city, and so the fact that he began to notice that 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 people were concentrated in a small area really led him to believe that this might be a chance for him to uh, to really study color and how it was spread. Um, so so in modern days we know that uh, rehydrating is the way to treat cholera. In those days they thought stopping fluids was the way to treat cholera. So they made the problem much worse by, well, once you were sick, they said, okay, no more water, uh, when, exi- when it was exactly the opposite that was necessary. You start tanking up. And, and so um, it, it's kind of a testament to the helter-skelter nature of medicine at the time that, that 20 years before, somebody had figured out that, hey, if you, if you inject somebody with a little bit of salt water, they do much better. But in, in all of the publishing that was going on about cholera, it got lost for another 40 years before somebody figured out, hey, IV fluids might have a role here. That is a uh, kind of an astonishing story, as you say, uh, trying to avoid people getting sick and making it infinitely worse uh, mm-hmm. in, the, in the avoidance. It, it does make you wonder... Um, how in in this world right now we're all kind of trying to uh, imagine what is best for us and and hearing from lots of different scientific opinions it it's a it's a great challenge particularly yeah. in a, in the politically charged uh, world that we're living in it seems like uh, science used to kind of cut across all that stuff and that maybe it doesn't quite so much anymore well we keep learning science keeps getting better but sometimes the smartest people in the world are wrong. <laughs> sometimes. So, President, um, let's wrap this episode up. Is there anything else you want to say? 
Now, this has been uh, this has been fun. My favorite part of this episode is just listening to everybody talk about their part, and it's a reminder to me of how much work it takes to get this podcast out. You know, it just seemed like magic to me. You and I talk, and then all of a sudden, it shows up. And so, and all it takes is six other people to do it. So, in addition to thanking our listeners, um, here's my thanks to all of you who helped us put this podcast together. Uh, and do such a very nice job. So, thank you all. You've been listening to Solutions for Higher Education, a podcast featuring Scott L. Wyatt, the president of Southern Utah University in Cedar City, Utah. This is our 100th episode celebration, and we've had as our guests Bailey Bothorp, Libby Meredith, Natasha Johnson, Lexi Carter, and Jill Whitaker, who are uh, our unsung heroes in getting the podcast out to the public. We thank them for their amazing behind-the-scenes work, sometimes on very short (laughs) turnarounds and all the other things that you do. And we thank you, our listeners, for uh, letting us get better over the course of 100 episodes. We hope we've uh, warranted your continued listening, and we'll be back with another podcast very soon. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to Solutions for Higher Education. To subscribe to this podcast, please visit www.suu.edu forward slash President's Podcast, where you will find both the audio and a written transcript of today's podcast. The original music for this podcast was composed by Jack Barton, a master's degree student in music technology at SUU. For more information about Southern Utah University, please visit www.suu.edu.